Well, good morning. Man, y'all sound so wonderful when y'all are singing, man. It's just, it's so beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, I hope y'all had a good Thanksgiving. Um, something that, you know, that is just truly so wonderful about, about this time of year that marks, you know, that we mark with this Thanksgiving holiday is to begin to get into this attitude, this mindset of gratitude, right? Of thankfulness, of, of, of service, of thinking of others, of, of really orienting ourselves outside of our selfish, normal selfish way of thinking. Um, and like the last songs uh, that we sang, man, it's just it's such a powerful song. Do you consistently fall on your knees before the Lord? That's something that I just, I love about this season is because it's that constant reminder of reorienting ourselves around Christ, centering ourselves around what he has for us, what he has done for us. Um, and it's recognizing that the gospel of peace that has come, not many of us recognize it is a gospel of peace. What happened? When, God, uh, when Jesus was born and the angels show up, they announce his birth, right? What is it that the angel said? Goodwill to man and peace on earth, right? He is springing the gospel of peace, what's been prophesied all throughout the scriptures. And peace with what? Does it look like it's peaceful in the world? No. But there is a reconciliation of peace between humanity and God and all those who turn to Christ. God has forgiven us. God has saved us. God has saved the sinner. The thing that separated us from God, God has, God has resolved that matter for us, and that is something that's worthy of praise. Um, so we're going to continue this week. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open up the first Timothy chapter 3. We're going to begin here. Uh, last week, um, I gave uh, uh, an overview of eldership and what that looked like. But before we got to eldership, we laid the groundwork, this long groundwork demonstrating what was going on in Paul's second missionary journey and his third journey as well. When he picks up Timothy, how he uses Timothy, everything that is going on during this time um, to be able to recognize and see when, when Paul writes to Timothy and he says to Timothy, Timothy, here's how you set up a church. Here's how you run the church. Here's how the church is to function. We needed that back information. All of this thing that is setting up and, and what's beginning, what's going on in Ephesus, what's happening in Ephesus. Why is Ephesus a big deal? Um, the, the, if you will, the spiritual powerhouses that were in Ephesus, how, what the, the warning that Paul gave to the elders of Ephesus of what was going to happen after Paul left. Paul already left, and he said, now listen, this is what's going to take place. Pay attention. Be aware. Wolves are going to come in among you to devour the flock. It's the whole purpose. It's the whole reason why they're going to come, and many of them come clothed in the name of Jesus. Jesus tells us about this as we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew in depth. We've been looking at this. Many will proclaim the name of Christ but they're yet to truly be transformed. I'm not saying that a person isn't saved, but I'm saying yet to be transformed. How many of you have ever felt the, the, the healing presence of God? I don't mean like a physical healing. I mean your actual inward being, the internal self that you are, and him lifting that demonic oppression, him lifting that selfishness, him lifting that kind of stuff off of you. It is unbelievably awesome, and yet that is what God comes to bring, and that glory to glory that the Bible talks about, moving from glory to glory, that's something that's supposed to be perpetually happening in the believer's life. For what purpose? That Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in people's lives. You will know they are my disciples by the way they love one another, not by the way they stick their nose up at one another. Does that make sense? There is an active work that's supposed to be taking place. How many of y'all actually read the letters of Timothy? Did anybody actually read that? Okay, there's a few. Wonderful. After we've gone through this, I wanted to lay this groundwork to see the depth that is going on within Timothy. And then we looked at about 30 years after Paul writes to Timothy, we read in Revelation what take place, what Jesus had to say to the church. And the church lost their first love. How did they lose their first love? Don't know. They had some spiritual giants there had Paul, they had Timothy, the, the Apostle John shows up there, Polycarp, one of, John's, uh, one of the Apostle John's disciples, he was there. What happened? What took place where they lost their first love? They did a lot of good works. Jesus gives them a lot of credit for that. Hey, you did a lot of good things. You've been doing a lot of good things. In fact, there's things that you do that I really like and I appreciate, and there's teachings that you also hate that I also hate. You did all that great, but you've lost something. You've lost the love of of Christ. You've lost the love of me. And he's saying to turn back to that. And one of the aspects, one of the importance of the eldership within a church 
is to make sure the church never loses its focus and ultimately um, not only proclaiming the truth and the full counsel of God, but also helping people move from glory to glory, to not stay in themselves and satisfied. I can't tell you how many Christians that I have met over the years, they're so satisfied and content with where they're at. They think they know it all and they're happy. They're fine. They sit right there. They can even attend frequently. They can even serve in churches. And they're totally, completely content with where they are. They've got it all. They've got a grip on all of it. I can tell you this. With as much as God has taught me in his word, I recognize how little I know. I used to come very arrogantly and proudfully to, to boast in what I know and share and do all this kind of stuff. And I think I've shared this with you guys before. Um, there was one, one evening uh, I had this opportunity to speak. It was the closing night of, 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 a, of a week, and it's like the decision night for, for everybody. And I get up, and I'm ready. I was asked to give the same message that I'd given before. I knew what the message was. I knew what to talk on. I knew the scriptures. I could quote it all by heart and walk right through it. I get up there to do it. I can't repeat the scripture. I can't talk about the person I'm, I'm trying to talk about. So I said, you know what? I'm going to open up and just read it because I'm stumbling all over the place. So I opened up to read it, and I couldn't read the text anymore. My eyes, it's not that my eyes didn't work. My eyes worked totally fine. I didn't ask anybody else, hey, does anybody else have a book or a magazine that I can look at? I'm pretty sure I can still read. I couldn't read the scripture. And I'm standing there completely embarrassed in front of everybody going, what in the world is going on? Lord, what's happened? What's going on? He said very clearly, this is what happens if you think you can do it yourself. I can take it all from you. I can hide it from you. I can close it from you. I am the God who gives, and I am the God who takes away, says he. So I learned a very valuable lesson. You have to walk humbly before your God. Otherwise, what you have and what you have been given, he can easily take away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? All right, so let's jump in here to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse chapter 1. I want to look at the elders again, and then we're going to move into the deacons, and we're going to try and build this. Uh, lots of different things that I want to try and cover, and hopefully... Um, well, we'll just see where the Lord leads us. So let's jump in. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. This is an elder. It's the same, same Greek word. It can mean overseer, bishop, elder. It's the, person, it's the persons that are in charge, that God places in charge in the church to make sure the church is moving towards the direction of God, that it's staying committed to God, and that it's moving people from glory to glory. Verse 2, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert. Or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into, tem uh, fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. There's a lot of high qualifications here that are laid out. One of the primary qualifications that distinguish the deacons and from the elders, the elders from the deacons, is this, this ability to teach. It doesn't mean that somebody gets up and teaches like me. That's not what this means. Or teaches like John MacArthur. Or teaches like whatever your teachers that you like. It's not what it's implying. It means that they should be able to take somebody and disciple them, evangelize them from the very beginning, and walk them through the Christian life, growing them into a mature believer. That's what this is implying. It's able to teach them the things of God. I've heard it said, well, you know what? You don't need man to teach you anything from the scripture. You don't need anything because God is the one doing it. I totally agree. The new covenant is about the Holy Spirit doing the work within us, right? As he promised in the new covenant, I will give you a new heart. I will give you my spirit in order that I will teach you these things. You won't need anybody else to teach you because I myself will teach you these things. So how do you... How do, you, how do you bring these ideas together where God is saying, you don't need someone to teach you, but then you see the scripture saying, but you must disciple and grow. You must disciple others. Is that not man leading man in things? Well, which is it? Is it God alone does the work and you sit isolated as a lone island, or is it that you are in community and you're growing with people around you? Which is supposed to happen? 
God works through the community, the group. Don't be like some, as the writer of Hebrews says, that make it their practice not gathering together. Don't be like these people, the scripture says. God, absolutely, your most intimate time with God should be personal time, you and him alone. It should be you and him alone digging through his word. I don't know about you, and this isn't just something that's relegated only to me because of the responsibility that I have teaching on Sundays. But when I sit alone with my Bible, not with commentaries, not with lexicons, not with any of the additional helps that that are very advantageous, but when I just sit alone with my Bible and I just read, the Spirit brings scriptures up to mine, and it, I start bouncing all over the place, and it is rich, and it is deep. But I'll tell you what one of the problems is, though. Confess to you. Confession of the pastor. It's very easy for me to put together a sermon for the object of, of, of um, sharing that information with you. Does that make sense? My alone time with God, I'm thinking about, oh, I should say this, and I should say this, and set this up for this message. It's easy for me to take all of my alone time with God to put together something to deliver, to dispense the information, rather than sitting in reflection saying, what is this truth doing in me? Is there any change? Is it invoking any response in my heart? Am I moving closer to the image of God? Is anything happening in me? Pastors fall into this, I'll tell you. Most of their time comes about, how can I deliver a good message? And all their time is spent doing that. And a lot of Christians, though they don't deliver the message in front of others, they spend that time learning the information, often just so they can uh, uh, spout it off to somebody else, rather than look, you know, let me say this. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll caveat with this. How long has it been since you've read the, the letter of James? You don't have to actually have to answer that, but just think about it. The letter of James is a completely self-reflecting letter. It's easy. Uh, the very first book that I taught through here was the letter of James, and we went through it in detail, showing the connections from the Gospel of Matthew and all these different things, showing and, ex- and ex- expounding upon all these truths that are in there. But if you just read the letter just straight through and you look at it, just what it says about the tongue, that we all stumble in many ways. Do you believe that about yourself? That you stumble, not just stumble, but in many ways. And that, and that if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. It goes on to talk about this, this tongue of ours, that it, it is a, it, it, it's fire, that it's a world of unrighteousness, that it stains the entire body, it sets on fire the entire course of life, and it's set on fire by hell. Do we believe this about our own tongues? That this thing right here is what absolutely destroys us and destroys others. We can get on Sundays and we can put on our our false piety and say, praise God, bless the Lord, oh my soul, right? But then we use that same tongue to cut down other people. Do we read the scripture in such an aspect where it is reading us? Where it's reading you and you're recognizing the depth of your own depravity and the need for the change to take place in your own heart? It's something that I know that I have to constantly reflect upon and make sure that I'm not studying and not reading just for the sake of teaching, but that I'm actually reflecting upon is something changing in me um, where I can stand before God because I don't get to stand before God with all all of y'all. I can stand before God alone. The judgment seat of Christ, just like everybody else here that calls upon the name of Jesus. You stand there alone. And what will that look like with your Savior, with your King? Be, be, man, be asking God, God, may the word do something in me. May it change me. And Jesus says one of the ways that you can example that, that it's doing something, is you will be filled with love, with peace, with patience, with kindness. Just keep going down the list. Something that he offers is something that he offers, and he doesn't give the way that the world gives. Okay, so he lays out the qualifications of the elders, and then he goes, and in verse 8 here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, he says, deacons likewise must be dignified. When he says the word likewise, it's indicating that there's a second group here. These are distinct offices, distinct positions. Deacons likewise. 
talked about elders. Now, likewise, deacons. And he goes on about deacons now. Deacons must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I want to keep reading because notice what Paul says. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay... You may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Notice he's giving the behavior qualifications of leadership. How one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Every one of those phrases are found littered throughout the New Testament. This is one of those areas in the scriptures where it looks like there was early creeds in the very beginning of the early church where they would simplify, but yet, all, but not, I wouldn't say simplify, but concisely state what they believe. It was, it, was, it was concise, and this is one of those moments. But Paul lays out the qualifications of the leadership and the way that a church is supposed to function, the way that it's supposed to operate. For what purpose? Because the church isn't ours. This, this isn't our building. This isn't our church. Not a single one of you that, as far as I know, have gone and hanged on a cross for someone's sin. Let alone, you'd be hanging on a cross for your own sin. Amen? Amen? I can't go serve the penalty for your sin when I'm full of my own. If I don't believe it, do we need to read James chapter 3 again, talking about our tongue? It's full of deadly poison. A world of unrighteousness set on fire by hell. This church is not ours. I'm not saying this church has, but many churches turn into social clubs. Anybody ever experienced that before? I have absolutely experienced both. I have served in a church where the names of the two families were in the stained glass windows. The irony is those two names of the main families drove the church into the ground and it's closed today. Irony, is it not? You walk into the church like, like, why is this church closed and nothing's happening with this beautiful building, all this money in the bank account, and nothing's taking place? Well, it's etched into the glass. It's put into the pews. It's on a plaque on the building outside. The names that drove it into the ground. Because when we lose the focus that this is not ours, but we are stewards of what God has given us, we lose the entire reason why we exist. But Christian, we can do the same thing personally in our lives as well. Especially when we've grown up in church stuff. We can lose that first love, that adoration, that, that literally being in love with Christ. Where we're, we're longing to spend time with him, to hear from him, and to commune with him. How many things get in your way that you can't read the Bible every day? How, how about just once a week? How many things get in your way? You know how many times I hear this? I'm too busy. How, how long have you been on Facebook and TikTok and X and how long have you been watching TV? I'm not saying any of those things are inherently bad. I'm just saying it's not a priority. But do you remember when you were first saved, the priority that Christ was in your life? The love that you had for him and you were being filled with something that was unspeakable? You couldn't, even, you couldn't wait to share it and talk about it? Why do we get to a place that we're so matured that we have no time or adoration or affection towards our God? That's one of the things that's interesting about this time of year and this season is it reorients the mind. And what's shockingly is that even the world does something similar, allowing us incredible opportunity to evangelize in those moments. 
Because even atheists do good work. You understand that, right? Even pagans do good work. Anybody here hear Bill Gates? Not all the work he does is great. But he does a lot of good things. A lot of humanitarian efforts. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything. Just like it doesn't mean anything when a Christian does a whole lot of good works, but their lives and the way that they live is nothing but a pounding, glinging symbol. Right? Y'all remember when Paul talks about the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, this intimacy, this life in the Spirit, and all these riches that he comes to bring us and give us in this life. And he says, I can have all of these things, yet if I have not love, I'm nothing but a clinging, gonging symbol. It means nothing. It means nothing. So, let's come back to this. They lay out why the church exists and the importance of how and the reason and how to set up the church. He talks about the elders and he talks about deacons and he uses this word likewise to indicate he's moving to a separate office. But then look here in verse 11. He also says their wives likewise must be dignified. Notice he's using the same word from verse 8 indicating there's now a third group. This is where denominational tradition often gets in the place of translation. Let me show you something here. When it says their wives likewise must be dignified, Paul is indicating in the Greek a third group of people. And he says the deacon's wives. Now this is really odd. He mentions nothing of the elder's wives. The wives and the elders, um, the wives of the elders. The elders are actually the ones with the responsibility to make sure sound doctrinal teaching is happening, to make sure the church is moving in a godly perspective, to make sure that there is unity in the body and everything's moving in a godly aspect. Their wives aren't mentioned, but somehow the deacon's wives are. The deacon's job, remember, we're going to get back to this in Matthew chapter 20, but what is a deacon? What is a, a diakonos? It's a servant. That's simply what it is. It wasn't a, a very liked position, let me tell you that. This wasn't a position that, that any good standing Hebrew would look to want to take. How many times do we read in the gospel when Jesus is somewhere and it's the servants that are serving the tables? Or, better yet, do we read of any times where it's the women serving the men? Y'all read that in the scriptures? Or is it just me? The men didn't want to take this lower position of servant. They didn't want to take this, this position of serving tables. They thought it was above them. And they didn't want to step into that. That was literally only the, the hired servants, only the ones that are paid to do this do this, or the women do this. And Paul is using this word to create an office of the deacon within the church. They're the table servers. They're the ones that literally go throughout the families in the church to make sure their needs, physical needs, are being met that spiritual needs are being met. They are not responsible for teaching. They are not responsible for leadership. They are not responsible for any of the way the church is moving. They're servants to serve people. And it's very difficult to break this mindset, especially in the Baptist denomination, because we combine elder and deacon together. We see them as one, but they're two separate offices. But let me show you something else here in the text. And we don't see this in the English translations as well, but this is saying in verse 11 here, he's saying, their wives likewise. You know the other way that this can be translated? Women likewise must be dignified, not slanderous, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Hold on a second. What are you saying, Shane? I'm saying there's a third office here, and it ain't referring to men or the deacon's wives. It's the Greek word gune. Greek word gune means, ready? Women. And it's women that are virgins, it's women that are married, it's women that are betrothed, it's women that have been widowed, it's women. This verse shows up, I'm sorry, no, this verse, this word shows up many places in the New Testament, including in Matthew chapter 5. I'll just, I'll acknowledge them to you. When Jesus talks about lust, if anyone looks at a woman with lust in his heart, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. Guess what word for woman is being used there? Gune. A couple verses down, when Jesus starts talking about divorce, if anyone divorces his wife, guess what word he's using there for wife? Gune. It's the same word. So this is one of those places where denominational influence can translate scriptures into a mindset. They're believing, when they translate this, that this is deacons' wives. Can it be written that way in Greek? Certainly can be. 
but it's actually talking about women. And this is why Paul uses this word likewise twice. In, chat, in verse 8, he says likewise, indicating that there's a separate office, not elders. Now we're likewise deacons, likewise women. He's talking about women deacons. That's what he's talking about there. And it makes absolutely no sense that he would refer to deacons' wives and not elders' wives, when the elders are the ones responsible for all the teaching, instruction, doctrine, theology of the church, stewarding everything within the church. Makes no mention of them, but the deacons' wives, the ones who serve the families and serve the tables, that clean the church, yada, 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 go right on down. But their wives are mentioned, it doesn't make any sense. And here's something else. There's no feminine form for the word diakonos. So Paul couldn't say deaconess. What, what do I mean by that? Are you all aware in Hebrew and Greek and Spanish, a lot of the Latin languages and stuff, they have feminine endings and masculine endings. And you change a word depending by whom you're referring to. Um, Greek does the same thing. In fact, what's interesting, it's a gender in word. Um, we now use the word gender to refer to the sexes, male and female, right? If you're interested in this, I believe the psychologist's name is John Money. Look up John Money. John Money is the guy who coined the term gender to be used concerning the sexes. John Money was an incredibly evil man, absolutely demonic possessed, did lots of sexual sin with children, and did all sorts of really bad things. This is the guy who has conflated the language, took something. Gender was only ever a word used in language, never used biologically, until John Money coined it, Dr. John Money got a doctor there, so he must be right. And you find out how this morphology, the entomology of the word, how this, how this got to this point, this is what culture is dealing with now when we deal with, he's the guy who coined transgenderism, all these kinds of terms. He borrowed the word from language. Okay, so let's just come back here. The reality is many Greek words, some of them can have a masculine ending, some of them have a feminine ending, some of them can be neutered, and it all depends. It's how you get your subject, your context, and everything going on. Diakonos is only masculine ending. There is no feminine ending to it. So he can't say deaconesses. There's not a word for it in the Greek to define what he's saying. That's why he uses the word gune. Women, likewise, must be dignified. And he goes down this list. Okay, let's look at something here. I want to point out something here also, because uh, uh, Paul later mentions it within in Timothy here in chapter 5. When it talks about the separation between the elders and the deacons and the two offices and what they are, the main qualification that is different between the two, right, I talked about was able to teach. It's this aspect of teaching. Look over in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, and um, it even says here, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially for those who labor in preaching and teaching. So notice Paul is making a distinction between the elders. There's predominant elders that are around and focused on and delivering the preaching and teaching. It doesn't mean all of them are doing that. Does that make sense? He's distinguishing there's different aspects in what the elders are bringing, but they still are to embody these, these aspects, but their responsibilities will look different within the scriptures. Okay, let's go over to, um, let's go over to Acts chapter 6. We'll start here. Acts chapter 6 is often used to demonstrate when the first deacons were elected within the early church. Now, nowhere are these men called deacons, but they're, what they're doing within the body correlates to what Paul later defines to Timothy, the office of a deacon. Does that make sense? Acts chapter 6 chronologically takes place first. Then Paul later, after on his third missionary journey, way after Acts chapter 6, way after Acts chapter 6 is dealing with the church in Jerusalem as it's birthing. Remember, it started on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. 3,000 people are saved in one day. Then every day, people are being added and added and added and added to that number. And there became a problem within the church. And we're going to get to that problem. What I'm trying to get out, Paul hasn't even been saved yet when they're electing these people to serve in the, in, in the, in the Jerusalem church. Hasn't even been saved. He's still doing his thing, going after Christians, bringing them to court, persecuting them. He's doing everything he can to stop this Christian movement still during Acts chapter 6. Paul then, of course, is later than saved. He then goes on his missionary journeys, and he is evangelizing and planting churches, and he just, he's just going crazy. 
in a good way. And he's planning these churches, and he picked up Timothy. Remember, in his second missionary journey, he follows him around. He's discipling Timothy. He leaves Timothy in Corinth. He then leaves Timothy in Ephesus. And he's using him to build these churches up, set them up correctly, that they honor God, because it, the church is a living organism. It's not meant to be a means to an end. We don't gather here on Sundays for a means to an end. Well, check my box. I've done, I've done the good Christianly thing, and I'm good to go now. Absolutely not. This is supposed to be a moment of which I am encouraging and exhorting us within the scriptures to rise up, take up the mantle of responsibility, and go live it out there, reaching the lost, because the fields are white for harvest. God is already at work, but he's wondering, why aren't you going? Why aren't you interacting with the lost? Why aren't you interacting with the people that are hurting, helping pull them out of the ditch? Quit sticking your nose up at them that they're in the ditch. They already know they're in the ditch. They don't need somebody to mock them in the ditch. They need someone to pull them up and say, come and sit at the feet of Jesus. You will be changed. How awesome would it be, beloved, that instead of just evangelizing somebody, say, listen, I can talk to you all, all day about Jesus, but what if, what if we just go and meet him right now? And you start praying with him. Say, Lord, here's my friend. Would they, can they just meet you right now? And their life has changed. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm talking about like real supernatural things going on because God is in the business of yanking people out of the ditch Putting, putting a new robe on and putting a ring on their fingers, sandals on their feet, and slaughtering the fattest calf right after he's embraced them and kissed them and loved all over them. Luke 15, amen? Do we know this God? This is the God we get to go share. So Sundays is meant to be not as a means to an end, but a means of exhortation in the scripture. So we go out and we grab, we yank the people that are being lost out of the darkness that they're in. Not to clean them not to change their behaviors. Jesus is in that business. Amen? Okay. So Paul then eventually sets up the, the church in Ephesus. He leaves, speaks to the elders in Acts, in Acts 17. Later on, he then sends Timothy. I'm just trying to put this into perspective of where Acts chapter 6 is. This is why these men aren't called deacons. Paul doesn't classify this category of servants in the church until later on. And he writes to Timothy. So let's go ahead and pick up Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, notice how it describes believers. It says the disciples were growing. I, want to, I just want to point out to you, you'll, you'll read this all through Acts. It will, it will actually distinguish to you those that are followers of God and those that aren't followers of God all through Acts. It calls the followers disciples. It does this all throughout the letter. It does it all throughout. It recognizes the spirit can recognize who is his and whose isn't. Amen? And he identifies them within. The disciples were increasing in number. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. So notice what it's identifying, to serve tables. This deacon position. Verse 3, Therefore, brothers, this is another one of those points where the Greek, the word is only in the masculine form. Adelphoi, but it's referring to brothers and sisters. This is one of those gender things in words, just like we looked at earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's just a gender thing. It implies brothers and sisters. Therefore, church, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied minimally. Wait, what? Greatly, I say greatly in yours. Multiply greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, let's break this down because this is a phenomenal portion in Scripture. Okay, we're just going to try to hit some of these highlights. Disciples are increasing, the church is growing, but now there, now there becomes a complaint by the Hellenists who rose against the Hebrew because of their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Taking care of widows was a big thing 
in Judaism. It was normally the priests at the temple that took care of the widows. They were in charge of the distribution and making sure their physical needs were met. Do y'all remember when we were in the Gospel of Matthew and Jesus is actually rebuking the Pharisees because they're not taking care of the widows? They boast in all their their religious arrogance and pride, but they're failing to do the most basic of thing, the, the thing that says serve and love one another, but you're, you're ignoring these people. Not only that, earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, remember all the things, hey, mom, pop, you know, I'd love to help you, but all my stuff is Corbin, dedicated to God. I can't use my, my resources to take care of you. They look for any excuse they can to why they didn't have to be involved in demonstrating the heart of God. Jesus rebukes him on that multiple times. But here is something that's interesting going on. A Hellenist and a Hebrew. What is this referring to? In short, Hellenists were, were Jews, but they were more influenced by Greek culture. The Hebrews are also Jews, but they lean more to the Hebrew culture. And they're predominantly from Judea. The Hellenists are from the Diaspora. Anybody ever hear of the Diaspora? It means they could have come from anywhere in the Roman Empire. And there's a problem. They feel like their widows are being neglected, meaning that the Hebrew widows are getting more of a portion or better care than their own widows are. Now, it's not likely that this was intentional. You're talking about a massive church here. 3,000 saved on one day, and every day numbers are being added to them. And it's growing quickly. And they're recognizing a problem. How in the world do you manage something this large? But notice also that the apostles took the complaint seriously. They didn't dismiss it. But then they also didn't just take the complaint seriously. Oh, first, I just want to point out, you recognize that this could have been a moment of great division. What was an unintentional wrong being done could have been the beginning of great conflict. And it was starting to bridge over ethnic issues. Anybody hear of racism? It could have be become a major, major point of contention through something completely unintentional. You know how this happens often in Christianity today? Is that somebody can make a comment, and we hear the comment, and we take, we take an offense to it. And we hold that bitterness, and we hold that grudge, and we carry that thing around, and now I've got disunity. I never go and talk to the person of which I feel the offense from. I never try to get it right with them. I just hold it. That's how these, these unintentional things can start to, to birth into a major conflict. We've talked about this before, beloved. Satan does not have to work very hard in the church to cause a whole lot of problems. Our flesh natures do quite, quite enough. Amen? So the apostles were recognizing this. They took this, the, the, the complaint serious, and then they did something. They summon the entire church together. They bring all the disciples together and say, listen, we want you to nominate, nominate men to us, seven of them of good repute, full of the Spirit, whom we will appoint. This is not a congregationally governed church. You understand that? The apostles are saying, we will appoint them, not the church. But church, nominate them. Bring them to us. Because ultimately, we have the responsibility, they're saying, to make sure whoever is placed within a leadership position and role is actually qualified and capable of doing it. Because what purpose? It's not right that we are being taken away from our and the duties that we're responsible to do in order to serve tables. This can be managed, and there's other people God is raising up to do these tasks, to do, these, to do this role. And so they do that. Now, I want to point out to you, all of these names that are listed here, they're all Greek names. These aren't Hebrews. Who brought the complaint to the church? Was it the Hellenist Jews or the Hebrews? It was the Hellenists the ones that were more Greek. Look who the church nominated, seven Greek men. And the apostles said, that is good. Let's use them. They could have easily said, nah, 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 nah. We need to get some Hebrews in here. Your complaint's not important enough. No, they listened to what was going on, and seven Greek men are nominated. The apostles are in agreement. They lay hands on them and pray for them. Now look what takes place here. 
I want to I hit on something here, and we're going to move to something. Why are they only electing men here? And I want to point something out. But first off, in verse 7, after they lay hands and pray on them, the word of God continued to increase. Praise God. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. As soon as they set this up to function properly and correctly within their body, the church flourished even more. Even more it flourished. And then what happens? Don't miss this last sentence. A great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Where do the priests serve? They serve in the temple. You catching what's going on here? It's quite possible that if the Hellenist widows were to go to the temple to get a distribution, they would recognize they're following the way. That's what Christianity was called in Acts. They're following after Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. They're following after him. They would have recognized, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 you're, you're one of those disciples of these apostles and of Jesus. We ain't serving you. The priests are the ones that would have made those decisions in the temple. And look who also is coming to the faith by watching the behavior of the Christians, how they treat everyone. It is changing them to where a great many of the priests become obedient to the faith. What does that mean? It meant they became believers in Yeshua. Is that not amazing? I don't, think we, I don't think we can recognize how significant of a point this is happening in the early church. Every attempt that Satan tried to do to cause this thing to end turned to be the success of, of it, where the church flourished. A church always flourishes when it does it a biblical way. And beloved, the biblical way is elders and deacons. Now, why is it men that are being appointed here? Turn over to Matthew chapter 20. I preface this just in word in the beginning of the message, but I want to go back to Matthew chapter 20. Now, we've been through this already. Hopefully, this will be in memory. Matthew chapter 20, and we're going we're to start off in verse 24. Matthew chapter 20, verse 24. James and John want to sit at the left and right hand of Jesus. They're looking for that title, that position. They're looking to stand. Well, frankly, I mean, they're just really concerned about title. They're concerned about their, their status and how they, how they represent and what they are and who and what they are. You ever work with people like that? They're all concerned about what title they're given. I need to have chief executive or executive executive and executive executive of the executives, you know, like whatever it is. And they're so concerned about title. James and John appear to have this problem. Um, but look at what happens here in verse 24. And when the ten heard it, that they're asking for this position, in fact, their mom, even in Gospel of Matthew, shows that their mom came and asked, James and John in another Gospel, they themselves asked, but now their mom's asking Jesus, hey, will you give this to my two boys? The ten hear it, and they became indignant at the two brothers. They were mad. They were angry. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. What is he saying? He's saying the Gentiles are all about title and position. And they look for these positions. They lust for these positions. They do everything they can to achieve these positions in order that they can lord it over others. I'm the supervisor. I'm the manager. They lord it over them. This is what Gentiles do. But look at verse 26. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, diakonos. You want to be great in God's kingdom? You take the position of a servant. But look what he goes on to say. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, doulos, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We went in detail breaking down these words, doulos and diakonos, and showing the difference. In summary, 
Jesus is saying, you need to be a servant to all. So why do you think the apostles said, elect men, select them, select men in the church? You know why? Because he was, they were taking Jesus' word to break the custom of their day. It was the women who served. It was the women who served men. The men saw these things above them. And they're saying we are going to implement right here in the very beginning. Men, you, are, you must lead. And you must take the servant leadership position in order to lift up that for the health of the whole body. It wasn't because women were disqualified. The women would do it whether they had a title or not. Can I get an amen? amen. It's often men that are more concerned about, well, what am I and what title am I and what, what is this and what is that? Sometimes it happens in women. But most ministry that happens in church would stop if the women stopped. Amen? amen. I mean, it's, it's wild. While the men sit around puffing their chests for titles, the women are getting the work done. And this is, what, this is why the early church is saying we're changing the mindset of how we function and work. This is why priests were coming to God. And a great many of them were turning, because they're going, wait a minute. This is breaking all the customs. This is breaking everything. This is actually reorienting ourselves to honor and glorify God with our bodies. This is why the scriptures say, yes, there is no longer Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, but all are what in Messiah? One. They're all one in Messiah. Now hear me on this, though. There is a difference of responsibilities between men and women. So why are elders only allowed to be men? Deacons can be both. Why are, only, why are elders only allowed to be men? They're the ones that are in charge of the doctrine, theology, the, the presentation, make sure what's being taught and the, uh, is correct and accurate to the scriptures. They're able to teach and train and disciple people up. They're able to make sure the church is stewarding its resources and everything correctly. Why is that only given to men and women aren't allowed to be there? Beloved, because it goes back to that big C word called covenant. All the way back in the garden, we see Adam was given federal headship. He was given responsibility to lead his home and to lead the entire garden. What would have happened if, if after Eve ate of the fruit, he said, woman, honey, this is bad. We need to go repent right now and get before the Lord. And we know his great mercy and his love. He'll forgive us. He doesn't do that, does he? He abdicates his responsibility in leading. And he partakes of the fruit too, subjecting all of creation to the futility that you see, which now when you read the letter of Romans and Paul is talking about how everything's been subjected to futility, it's because of that dude Adam. But the last Adam came, Romans chapter 5, in order to reconcile us and bring peace between God and man, reconciling us to him, being the propitiation, the atonement, the forgiver of our sins. In what way? Just because he turns his head from him and go, I'm going to pretend it's not so bad. No. He says, I will place my wrath that all of our sin we deserve, God's wrath. He says, I will place my own wrath on myself so you never have to experience it. What a God. What a God to do that. Jesus was teaching them, listen, I came to serve, not to be served. And if there is ever a person that challenged the status quo of positions, it was Christ, who took not only the form of a diakonos, a servant, he took the form of a doulos by getting on his knees and washing his disciples' feet, this holy, pure, righteous God getting on his hands and knees to wash his disciples' dirty, nasty feet. And he's saying, to, he's saying to, his, to his boys there, who are soon to be apostles, I expect you to do the same. So when they had the moment to, to instill this thinking into the early church, they took it. They had the wisdom. They exercised the wisdom. And in Acts chapter 6, they say, they say church, nominate these seven men because we're going to show how we are to lead. And we're going to do it well. Okay. 
One of the things that Michael said uh, a couple weeks ago was that if anybody obviously has any questions concerning any of this, that there is a container back there to write your questions on, put them in there in order that we can field the questions. Uh, make sure to ask, you know, ask the questions that you may have. Um, and going through this last week and this week, this is a summary of what is happening in depth within the church. That's why I set it up last week in hopes that you would read the letter to Timothy and read Titus, that you can see this is how Paul is setting up this church to function in order that it can live life in the spirit and not be so in bondage. My goodness, beloved, why did Jesus come to set you free? So you can be free indeed. So you can actually be free. So you can experience what true life feels like. That you can recognize. You know, Jesus came to rectify all that's been upside down. We think upside down. Jesus says, let me help you think right side up. And the whole thing that is supposed to be developing and growing within the believer is a humility. An absolute humility. Absolute humility. Um, turn over to Second Peter. I'm sorry, let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. There's a humility that's supposed to be growing within in, in a believer. If there's ever a characteristic to identify Jesus living inside someone, they should be increasing within humility. If there's ever a characteristic and attribute that Jesus himself personified fully, completely, wholly, it was humility. Here is this perfect God coming down for the sole purpose to take on his own wrath to forgive us. So we never have to taste it or see it. And he does it strictly by serving us, pulling people out of the ditches, cleansing us from all the legalism, washing us from all of the, the, the complacency and apathy and religious vigor and all of it. He's cleaning us from all of it for the purpose that we might actually taste what life is supposed to be, a glimpse of what's to come we're supposed to be experiencing now and here. Believer, does that mean we won't have difficulty or persecution or tribulation or trouble? It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, you're guaranteed to have that. Guaranteed to have it. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Before he says that, he says, count the cost. He guarantees us as he, what he went through, we will go through. But if you've ever read stories of people who were martyred or people that have gone through like real serious persecution around the world, the hope and joy and fullness and love that they have for the people that are, that are like just horrifically treating them, how could somebody behave and act that way if it wasn't that they were living in something more real than what they were experiencing physically? That's called intimacy with the Most High God, and that is available to every one of us. But it begins as long as the foundation is laid properly. This is why when we went through Matthew 23, bad theology makes for bad practice, and Jesus is directly the seven woes against the Pharisee, and he's challenging these seven things. This is why he lays this down, because when you and I have bad theology, it makes for very, very bad practice. We can live in our false piety all we want, Totally fine. Pat ourselves on the back about how good we are. God loves you all, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> I mean, he loves you, Brandon, but I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm his favorite. I, I, I just, I've actually, I worked at a Christian bookstore that we sold those license plates. They were so disgusting. I was like, are you serious? What kind of, what is this, man? There's a lot of stuff we sold at that store that was not okay, including books <laughs> that give people bad theology, bad thinking, wrong stuff. So what is the purpose of the elders? What are they supposed to be watching for and doing? Well, 1 Peter chapter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Let me just pause here for a minute. Notice what Peter is calling himself. Peter is calling himself an elder. If you have your Bible, it's easier to see this because when you look in... 1 Peter 1, verse 1, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he's actually giving his greater title as an apostle. But here he's calling himself an elder. The early church in Jerusalem that we read in Acts, 
they had elders. We don't read when they appoint the elders, but we see that the elders show up, like in Acts 15 in the Jerusalem Council, the elders show up to this. The apostles are also functioning as elders. This isn't an age-specific thing. This isn't, okay, you know, like how we think of, like, in the South, an elder is somebody who's older than you. So you call them sir and miss. It's not, that's not the type of elder this is talking about. This is talking about a spiritually matured person who is grounded deeply in the faith that is capable of leading a flock, leading a congregation, making sure that's honoring the things of God. Peter is identifying himself as an elder. Now he's doing this because he's part of the church in Jerusalem. I don't know if any of you have ever heard this term. I'm a self-appointed elder. I'm a self-appointed this or self-appointed that. <clears throat> Bogus. These offices exist within the body of the church. That's what they're there for. It's not just self-appointed. I just, I, I think of this in my mind, therefore I identify as this. It doesn't work that way. It's an office within the body of the church for the health of the church. And Peter is saying here, I exhort the elders among you. I'm, I'm encouraging you as a fellow elder and also as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. This was one of the identifying marks for apostles that they actually walked physically with Jesus. This is why when you read early in the pages of Acts, Judas is, you know, he's gone and he's hanged himself, and, um, and Peter gets up, and they're like trying to figure out, well, we need to fill Judas's spot. Jesus started with 12. We better fill it in. <laughs> Let, how should we do this? Well, let's get a couple of people, and they list, they list out the qualifications. One of them is somebody who has walked with Jesus, has been through all of this stuff. He, they went through us with everything going on. So what does that tell you? When this Matthias and this other guy show up in Acts, you didn't read about them in the Gospels, did you? There was other people following Jesus that were disciples of Jesus that isn't just mentioned in the, like, you know, in the Gospels. There was a plethora of people that were following, as well as there's points in which there's a whole lot of people following Jesus. But then when he says, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, they go, oh, that's a hard saying. I'm going to have to leave Jesus now. And they left him. And it says many disciples turned and left. Okay. So one of the qualifications for an apostle was that they had to physically walk with Jesus on the planet and do the ministry with them for the three years. Now, how did the early apostles elect and fill in this 12th position? Well, they took matters into their own hands. They said, let's cast lots. Now, where in the world are they get in this concept of casting lots? Well, it's because in Proverbs, it says that the Lord controls every outcome of the lot that's cast. So they're like, well, there's really no other way to figure it out and ask. Let's just throw some dice and let's see what happens. God's going to make them land where they're supposed to land. And so it lands on, on the man and they say, all right, I guess you're right. So they all, all, all go pray over him. And then you never hear the dude's name again. And then somebody else shows up and calls himself an apostle. Who is it? Paul. Oh, wait a minute, I thought, I thought one of the qualifications listed out was that they had to walk with Jesus and do all this. It's because God appointed him an, an apostle. There's a difference. I don't know about y'all, but I'm familiar with denominations that they've got apostles running around all over the place. Not, listen, I'm not saying that the office of apostle doesn't still exist in some shape or form or some way, but what I am saying is this, the apostles sure did not brag about their title, apostle. Paul didn't even use that to lean into a lot of his letters. If you read what he often says, he says, a servant. If you read what it actually says in the Greek, a doulos of Jesus Christ. And he only defends his apostleship when it's necessary. So the point is that I'm getting at here is these men had a maturity that took place in them. But notice it was through a lot of hard knocks, especially with Peter. How many things do we get to see in the scriptures of Peter? Of Peter just saying something, man's foot and mouth, and he's embarrassed now, and Jesus corrects things. But now he's standing as his position as an apostle and as an elder, and he's currying the other el elders around him to do what? Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd them. That is among you. Exercising oversight. What does it mean to shepherd? I know that some of, some of y'all have sheep, goats, cattle, different things. You, you shepherd goats and sheep, but you drive cattle. You raise them differently. And the animal responds differently as well. Elders are not supposed to be like, you know, these pushers, like constantly kicking and saying, we're getting our way. That's not the qualification or the attitude of an elder. They're shepherding. 
They're inviting people to come along and saying, we have been given the responsibility to make sure that we are moving to the things of God. And as God declares, we're moving that direction. But it is, but they recognize that there is a chief shepherd above them that they are submitting to. Do you remember when I, when I said last week, you know, a lot of times when people think of elders and stuff, they think of like this ruling class, like here's the circles like the church and then this outer circle like ruling class dominating, domineering people getting their way. That's not the way the biblical eldership is set up. The biblical eldership is set up where here's the church and they're lifting it up to the glory of God. They're, they're in this servant leadership position helping build everyone up into the things of God, encouraging men to lead and take up that mantle of responsibility to spiritually lead their home, to spiritually lead, but never diminishing its women, but also encouraging its women to, to continue in doing what God has called and asked them to do. It's building up the entire body of Christ to serve in and out. I exhort you, elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Why? Because when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. This is why Paul is talking about this is why Peter is talking about. This is why Christ has set up this church in such a way to have these two functions, to have these two offices, to be able to operate so a church is healthy. For what purpose? That we might all receive this unfading crown of glory. <coughs> Likewise, you who are younger, this is younger spiritually, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You want an enemy that is, un, that is unbeatable? Stay living with pride and watch what God does. Amen? Watch what God does. That humility is supposed to be a characteristic within all of us. Um, ever increasing and growing. Ever evident within our lives. Um, Beloved, it's a summary of these positions within the church, the elders and the deacons, how they function, how they operate, what the purpose is for them, and how it is to grow and build. To, all, to visitors and things that are here, why are we going through this? Because we're at a point in our church right now where we are moving to an eldership model. So we have to reflect upon the scriptures to take a look at what does this actually look like and how has God said set up my church? How does he require his church to be set up? What does that look like? What does that take place? How does that take place? So there's got to be questions, and I'm sure there is, and I'd love to field the questions right now, but I'm sure a lot of y'all would like to go. So if you have questions, feel free to ask, but we also have the paper in the back uh, to write the question down as well. Put it in the back that we can field the questions. Um, let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the truth of your word, the clarity of your word. Um, you provide such clarity within it. You do not overcomplicate things, but man, we sure can. Lord, first and foremost, what I pray most importantly for each one of us, including myself, be God, begin this in me. Continue to grow a state of humility within Keep pride far from us. Pride is literally an abomination to you is what your word says. You say that pride is literally an abomination to you, that you stand opposed to the proud. We will not win that fight. In fact, pride, pride is even the root of all sin. All sin is rooted to pride, saying we know better. God, let us not stand in that position and in that posture at all before you in any area of our life. If the psalmist says, search our hearts, O God, and find any grievous way within us in order that we may repent of it. Bring it to our mind that we may repent of these things, that we may turn from these things. Father, remove hardness of heart. Remove 
um, anxiety. Father, remove fear, remove doubt. God, remove all of these things. I can pray forever and ever. We can pray in spiritual tongues. We can pray in the language of angels. But as Paul said, it means all not if we are not filled with your love. We can do signs and wonders and miracles, all these things. It all means nothing unless we're filled with your love. God, may we meet you. May we stand at your feet and never, ever desire to leave from that posture or that position. You've set the example of how to serve. May we serve as you have served. May we live as you have lived. Have your way among us, Lord. I also lift us up as a church body to you. As we are navigating and walking through these roads and building these things up, I know there has been talk that has gone out, and I know that there has been things that have happened. Those kind of idle chatter and idle things can cause such conflict. It can birth problems and issues. We pray against those things through the power of Jesus Christ, that those things will not continue, but that there will be a unity of a body of people coming around your word. This is not our church, it is your church. And we serve as under shepherds to the chief shepherd. And our lives are to reflect that in every aspect of our lives. Only you can perform that work within us. We can't even will will or just force that work within us. Your spirit, Lord, has to do that within us. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will do that in us individually as well as collectively. You are laying a foundation in which you are going to be, that you are going to do incredible things through. May your your will be accomplished. It's in Jesus' covenant name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved.